Hey, good morning, Point Church. Hey, I got a quick question for you. Any movie fans out there? You know, if you were to ask Kristen, my wife, she'll share that I'm an absolute sucker for just zoning out and watching a movie. You know, for me, having nothing on the agenda and sitting down to watch a movie, it's just a great night. Now, it rarely happens with the busyness of our kids, but that's a picture-perfect night for me. Well, one of my favorite movies is Lord of the Rings, right? I mean, it has it all. You know, but in this three-part movie series, one of the main characters, Frodo Baggins, has a decision to make, right? Frodo and his companions, they choose to go on this quest. Right? Frodo, he chooses to bear the burden of the ring while his friends choose to help protect him along the way. And Frodo chooses to carry the ring back to the fires of Mount Doom, right? To destroy the evil powers of Mordor and Sauron. Right? But is that really how it goes down in real life? And I don't mean the orcs, the wizards, the Hollywood sci-fi type entertainment stuff. No, I don't mean all that. I mean choosing to go on a journey or choosing to go on a quest. Do we really get to choose? You know, imagine with me this scenario. Let's imagine that you are going on a journey. You're going on a trip. But it's a journey that you have to take. It's not a decision that's up for debate. And you're informed upon entering this journey that it's going to be a dangerous trip. Look, there's going to be landmines in the ground that you cannot see. There'll be quicksand designed to stop you in your tracks. Explosives set to steer you off course. Road signs that give you the wrong information. Pits and valleys that you may fall into. All of these things will be all through this journey. But they won't necessarily be obvious to you, but they will occur throughout this journey on this trip that you must take. Now imagine with me that the person explaining all this to you, right? Explaining this journey to you, the person gives you a map. And on this map are all the places where the dangers lie. You know, the map is really descriptive. It's all on the map. It shows you where every landmine is, where the quicksand, the explosive, the pits, even the deceiving road signs. It's all on the map. And all these places that seek to harm you, these places that seek to destroy your life, they're all on the map, on this journey that you must take. Now, I think a key question is, how are you going to treat this map? You know, given what's on the map and given the journey that you must take, right, it kind of leads us to, to maybe three options we have. You know, maybe option one is you're going to quickly glance at the map, toss it aside, pursue this journey on your own, and just kind of rely on your feelings and your own understanding. You know, option two, you could study the map give it some attention, try it out for a while, then maybe on occasion, go back to it when things get bad. Or option three, you could keep the map near to you at all times, right? Allowing what's on the map to help guide you throughout this journey. Well, friends, we're all on this journey, right? You probably know where I'm going with this. You know, this journey is what we call life. And life is a highway, except we're not on it just all night long. It's a lot longer than just that. And guess what? You didn't choose to be on this journey. Look, if you're out there watching right now, you were born into this world, right? If you're breathing right now, then you're on this journey. And you have no other choice but to move forward through this journey of life. In fact, that's what we're going to talk about today. How do we navigate through all the dangers in life? And why does this journey often feel like a battle? You know, but before we dive in, I just want to welcome you here to The Point Church. My name is Caleb Kimmel. I'm the former interim pastor at The Point Church. A little cheer for that. Super excited. If you guys have been with us the last few weeks, we've announced that we have our new lead pastor, Pastor T.C. Mooney, his wife, Cody, and their kids joining our team. And, you know, Pastor T.C., he's recently accepted the call to become our next lead pastor, helping us move this vision of The Point Church forward, which is just going to be awesome. His humble spirit, his passion, their alignment for the values that we hold dear here at The Point Church, it's going to be something really, really special. You know, friends, if you're a first-time guest out there, we just want to say an extra special welcome to you. You actually picked kind of an amazing day to join us. You know, we're in a series we're calling Helping People Find and Follow Jesus, and that's a special title because it's the very mission statement of our church. It represents why we exist, right? We exist to help people find and follow Jesus. And today, we're trying to discover how to navigate through these battles in our life, this journey that we're on. And this battle is what we've referred to often as spiritual warfare. You know, the battle, it really matters for two reasons. One, if we ourselves are going to find and follow Jesus, then friends, guess what? You and I, we got to be prepared for the battles that we're in and the battles that lie ahead. And number two, if you're going to help others find and follow Jesus, well, guess what? You need to help prepare them for their battles and the battles that lie ahead. And what we're talking about is spiritual warfare. Now, I got to be honest. As a kid growing up, I would hear that term every once in a while when I was in church. And quite frankly, I wasn't sure what to think of it. Was it all made up? It kind of sounded like a movie theme rather than real life. And, you know, sure, I believe that evil existed. You know, that wasn't hard to see. 
But as I matured over the years, I started to better understand what this spiritual warfare is all about. That it is absolutely legit. It's real. And when we refer to spiritual warfare, what we're talking about is this battle that takes place in the unseen world. You know, last week, uh, Rick Cantor, he shared a verse with us. I want to go back to it again today because it's got so much packed into it. It's Ephesians 6, 11 through 12. And the Bible says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, there's a devotional interpretation of this verse as well in the Message Bible. I know it's just a devotional interpretation, but I find it interesting. It says, God is strong and he wants you strong. So take everything the master has set out for you, well-made weapons of the best materials, and put them to use so you'll be able to stand up against the devil and everything he throws your way. Look, there is no weekend war that we'll walk away from and forget about in a couple hours. This is for keeps, a life or death fight to the finish against the devil and his angels. Well, that concludes our service today. Good luck out there, friends. We'll see you later. <laughs> no, just joking, right? This is, this is some heavy stuff, right? I mean, these are significant words from Paul who wrote the book of Ephesians. You know, he's the author of these words. He, he wrote, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. But what does he mean by this struggle, right? I mean, who is this battle against? You know, our struggle is not against ourselves or each other, right? That would be flesh and blood, right? You and I, we're flesh and blood. Our neighbors, our fellow citizens, individuals from around other countries, right? They are all flesh and blood. But Paul says the battle is not against that. And so I believe Revelation 12.10, I think that can help us understand, discover just exactly what we're battling with. You know, the Bible says, For the accuser of our brothers and sisters, who accuses them before God day and night, has been hurled down. You know, right here, the Bible refers to Satan, the devil, as the accuser of Christians. For the accuser of brothers and sisters who accuses them before God. You know, who is Satan? And what does he look like, friends? Well, here's a picture of it. Satan's number one job, he has chosen, he's chosen this role. His goal is to put you down. And I'm not saying that in some lighthearted way. No, I'm talking about an aggressive pursuit to destroy your life. You know, in order to understand spiritual warfare and how we're going to navigate through this journey that we must take, look, we need to understand a few things about Satan. Number one, look, Satan, he hates God. And he hates anything that God has created. And what he hates most, let me ask you a question. What did God create in his own image? Yeah, you and me, you and I, right? You and I are a child of God. Therefore, Satan, lean in on this, he hates you. Yep, Satan hates God and he hates you. You know, we hear this statement a lot that, that God loves you and has a plan for your life. Well, guess what? That's true. But I think sometimes we might need to be reminded every once in a while of the other statement, that Satan hates you and he has a plan to destroy your life. Look, we have to establish that he hates you. Now, now Satan, he wants to hurt God, but he can't hurt God. He doesn't have that kind of authority, power, or reach, but he does have access to you and he can hurt you. You know, parents out there, you know, what's one of the quickest ways that can hurt you? Look as if someone hurts your kid, right? If you want to try and hurt a mom's heart, just go after her child. You want to try and destroy a dad, then attack their kid. You know, Satan can't get at God, but he understands that he can go after you. And there is this unseen spiritual battle going on all around you. What does the battle feel like? Oh man, it feels like that pressure to make your life miserable, right? To make you cave in, to chase things of no value, to keep you distracted, to keep you arguing with others, to keep you doing what is good to keep you from doing what is right. And guess what? Look, this battle is taking place in this journey that we must take. And it's not really coming from other people. Like that's one thing I want you to understand. Like you have to kind of look beyond the people. People are often just many times pawns to Satan, right? They're just tools or just weapons. And many times if we're not careful, you and I, we may not even know it, but we can be used by the devil. Remember this battle, it really matters for two reasons. If we ourselves are going to find and follow Jesus, we need to be prepared. And if we're going to help others find and follow Jesus, then we need to help prepare them. You know, many of you may know part of my part of my career has been in the sports world. And look, if you're going to compete well or, or battle against another team, then you need to understand your opponent, right? I mean, you need to size them up. You need to kind of watch some film, take some notes, look at scouting reports, study their play, study their tendencies. Ultimately, what you're studying is their strategy in order to prepare to compete against them, right? Well, friends, the Bible gives us the scouting report. Look, this is the playbook of Satan. You ready? 
I'm going to go through these really quickly, but there's nine plays from Satan's playbook that are clearly mentioned in the Bible. Now, we're going to go through them fast, so you can take some notes. They'll be up on the screen. But these are scripture references for each one of these that you could study later. But this is my challenge to you because we don't have time to go through all these this morning. See if you can jot them out fast. Now, remember, Satan's strategies are all about deception, right? So the Bible tells us, number one, he twists the word of God. Number two, he disguises himself. And three, he imitates. Four, he counterfeits. Number five, he steals, he kills, and he destroys. Number six, he afflicts and oppresses. Seven, he accuses, as we mentioned earlier. Number eight, he blinds. Number nine, he hinders. Right? This is all not good stuff. But what I want us to discover is what happens if we fall into one of Satan's strategies or we fall for one of his strategies. You know, How does this play out in our lives when Satan is winning this battle? So we'll discover five results in our life if we allow Satan's deceptions to work into our life in some way. Because I think that's the big curiosity, right? How does this apply to our lives? How does this play out in our lives? And so if if there's one strategy that Satan comes back to time and time again, it's creating division, right? Whether it's division in the church, in our homes, in our relationships. Look, Satan uses those nine strategies we mentioned to create division. And why wouldn't Satan use that strategy? I mean, it works, right? I know in my marriage, if Satan wants to create a situation where Chris and I are divided, he loves it. I know if our neighbors, right, if we're arguing with one another over petty things, Satan loves it. In the church, if Satan gets us quarreling over things that are relevant, he takes pleasure in it, right? So how do we know division is a sign of activity or the presence of evil? Well, Paul, he actually explained this very question of the Galatian church. Right? He begins by listing these characteristics of people whose lives are being influenced by evil. Right? It's Galatians 5, 19 through 21. And here's what Paul writes. He says, the acts of the flesh are obvious, right? Sexual immorality, impur- impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, our friends, this is a list that we should be on guard against, right? Paul isn't trying to do a beatdown session. He's informing us of what's going on, especially in a culture today that's aggressively gravitating towards do what feels good or that line of discover your truth, right? These two concepts in our culture today, they come directly from the author of lies, who's on the prowl and who loves to see you divided, right? He loves to see you angry, full of hatred, confused, and chasing all the wrong things. He loves it. Now, friends, let's contrast that with what the Holy Spirit generates in people's lives, right? When the Holy Spirit gets a hold of a person or a church, here's what Paul shares. He shares what is produced in Galatians 5, right? He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, right? This is what pleases our Heavenly Father. This is a result of giving God room to work in our life. And if you're going to find Jesus and follow him, Look, we're not going to be perfect, but we should start to see some of these outcomes, these impacts that flow out of a relationship with Jesus. But remember, Satan hates those things, right? And so number two, Satan's going to use his strategies to also create arrogance. Arrogance can creep in our lives really easily. Yeah, be really on guard on this one. In fact, usually there's two primary ways that we can succumb to arrogance. Number one, it's success. When success creeps in and And number two is using a false definition of maturity. You know, I remember falling into this trap a few years back. You know, Chris and I, you know, we've dedicated a lot of our professional career to help building up an organization called the World Baseball Academy as a legit youth development nonprofit here in our area. And it's taken about 14 years or plus to gain the trust and resources to build the infrastructure, infrastructure of the organization. But it was around 2018 or 2019 where we accomplished one of our BHAG goals, this big, hairy, audacious goal of building a top amateur youth baseball facility in northern Indiana and grew our outreach efforts for at-risk youth. And it all sounds like great stuff, right? Well, the problem was during the height of those breakthrough successes, I found myself starting to drift a little bit, what I call no man's land in my spiritual journey. I wasn't making terrible choices or anything of that nature, but due to the successes, there was a little bit of arrogance that crept in, kind of like, you know what, I got this, I can kind of do this. And I started to allow myself to get distanced from my dependency on God. And guess who loves that, right? Guess who loves to see that situation played out, right? The one who loves to blind us with success and false sense of maturity, right? Satan loves that. And we need to be on guard against this arrogance, thinking that we have all the answers because, quite frankly, we don't, right? And Satan knows this. You know, Satan also uses these nine strategies we talked about to create discouragement. 
You know, remember back in Revelation 12, 10, it said for the accuser of our brothers and sisters, right? Discouragement sounds like a whisper in your ear. Things like, you're no good. You're not making a difference. You always mess up. What's the point? You might as well give up. What you're doing doesn't matter, right? It's those whispers we have to be careful of. You know, just a couple days ago, I felt the full weight of those whispers, right? Heavy spiritual warfare in our home. I walked into our garage to see Kristen, my wife. She was vacuuming out the car and she just had tears run down her face. And immediately I could see that she was just utterly discouraged. And, and when she cries, she wants to kind of push everyone away and just kind of wants to be left alone. And when I see her cry, I want to draw near and try to help. And there was just this heavy atmosphere of discouragement. And, you know, as Kristen, you know, she works her tail off as a fundraising professional, as a mom, as a leader in our community. She does a million things, carries a lot of responsibility on her shoulders. Well, we caught these whispers in her ear, right? Satan telling her things, just like I mentioned, like, you're not making a difference. What's the point? What you do doesn't matter. And now we engaged immediately in some conversations to work through some of the reasons she was feeling this way. And, and I've been praying for her. We let the kids know that mom needs some encouragement. And But here's what happened, friends. See, Kristen and I, we were able to quickly pinpoint some of the exact strategies that were attacking her. The stuff that we're talking about today. And, and I say we because this attack weighed on, on both of us. But here's the good news. We recovered well. I mean, the next day she got re-energized and refocused. But I share this to tell you this for an important reason. We were able to recover so quickly. Why? Because we understood the playbook. We knew the accusers on the prowl. We knew he laughs in our face to seek and discourage us. Right? He, he takes on pleasure with this. And if you don't know his tactics, you can fall in these traps and get stuck there on this journey that you're in, that you and I must take. Right? Now, Satan, he also uses these strategies to create self-pity. Man, if you think discouragement's bad, self-pity gets even worse. You know, if, if discouragement is left unchecked, it grows and self-pity is like discouragement on steroids. I heard one pastor say this, self-pity chisels in stone, but discouragement whispers. It tells you that there is no way out, that this is the way it always be. And simultaneously, we fall into this trap of a feeling like that self-pity is both our fault and, and somebody else has pushed this on us. And it's dangerous. It, it puts you in a position where you kind of move to the sidelines. You, you live in this state of self-pity means that you don't need anyone to, to take you out of the game anymore because you've kind of taken yourself out. And it's an incredible effective strategy and completely counter to the gospel, what God calls us to do. Right now, this last strategy that we should be aware of, right? Satan, he uses these strategies to create the blurring of moral lines, right? C.S. Lewis, a famous Christian author, he once wrote, the safest road to hell is the gradual one. The gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. You know, Casting Crowns has a really famous song called Slow Fade. And I think it captures what can happen if Satan's strategies start to take root in our life. Often it happens when you start to compromise on the small things. right? Maybe you take a deduction that you shouldn't on your taxes or you, you get a little too close emotionally to someone you're not married to. And sure, nothing happened, but deep down, you know something is happening in your heart. Or maybe just shade the truth a little in conversations to make yourself or a situation look better than they really do. You know, the first moral lapse is always the hardest. Then it get easier from there, right? So be on guard. You know, and, and here's the thing. Talking about Satan, talking about the work of the enemy, it's really not an easy task, right? The challenge here, I think, lies at the extremes. Look, there are some Christian leaders who will never talk about Satan, and there's others who talk incessantly about him, right? You know what I mean. Like, every time the toast burns or something goes wrong, you know, their way, and Satan is behind it, and it's time for an exorcism. But, you know, the thing is, neither extreme is particularly helpful. But in a similar way, friends, man, I just want to plead with you. One of the greatest mistakes I believe that you and I can make when it comes to evil is if we overestimate or underestimate its influence. All right, I'll say that again. One of the greatest mistakes we can do when it comes to evils, we overestimate or underestimate its influence. Look, it doesn't have ultimate power, but it isn't powerless. Evil is active. And in some way, if you do a self-audit, you might discover that it's influencing certain areas of your life. You got to be on guard. Is it influencing your thought life, your ministry opportunities, your family? But friends, here's the good news. Look, friends, Satan, he's been called out. He's been fully exposed and his strategies, look, they're nothing new. And the Bible has exposed him from, for everything that he is. So friends, 
on this journey of life that you and I must take, look, we have been given a map. We've been given a map that outlines where all the landmines are, all the quicksand, all the deceptive road signs that will be in your lives. Look, the map is the Bible. It is God's word that's been given to us. Look, friends, the question I have for you is, what are you going to do with the map? Right? Here's your challenge, right? With this map that we have been given, what is our response going to be? And I kind of consider us in one of three camps when it comes to this journey that we're on that we must take. Right? And camp number one is we can discard the roadmap, right? We can toss the Bible aside. We can, we can take what we hear about evil and Satan. We can set it aside as nonsense, a bunch of made up religious stuff from centuries ago. And, and I get why some people might feel that way, but, but be careful. Because you can go through this journey on life relying solely on your own understanding, your own feelings, your own judgment, and be completely misled. And if you think this is all a bunch of nonsense, just be careful that Satan is not just using one of his effective strategies and you're becoming a pawn in his game. Friends, I had a friend who was far from Jesus finally actually read the Bible and he said to me, it changed everything. And he said it in a really simple way. He just said, Caleb, you know, I read the Bible and I could not deny how the Bible explained everything going on in this world and everything going on in my life. It just reflected reality. And I urge you, friends, look, read it, study it, research it. It will not return void. That's a promise from God. Now, if this roadmap, the Bible, is just something you use on occasion, you might be in camp number two. You might be in this lukewarm Christian category, which be careful, right? Because that means we're kind of drifting through this journey. And when things get bad, maybe we return to it, right? Maybe we don't. But friends, here's the problem with that, right? you might be missing out what God has in store for you, right? You're missing out on this fruit and this fulfillment, this opportunity to use your passion for his glory, which gives us purpose in this life. Now, maybe you're in category three, right? Maybe you're a solid believer and, and you know exactly what we're talking about, right? You understand the importance of being reminded of this map that has everything that we need in it. The Bible is everything we need, right? Because it draws us closer to him. But my challenge to you today, ask yourself, what am I doing with the map? Right? What am I doing with this ultimate map that can spell out all the pitfalls, all the things around me? Friends, we are all called right, to this journey of life that we must take. My question for all of us, are we allowing the truth of God's word to be the roadmap in all areas of our life? Look, that's my heart's desire for you this morning, is that we can be humble servants of our Heavenly Father. Open up His word and allow His word to lead us. Let me lead us in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, boy, this is a heavy talk, topic. When we start talking about Satan, the accuser, or the author of lies, uh, Lord, it's hard. Uh, many times our doubts can come up. Is this really real? But man, there's another part of us that feels the reality of this, that we feel the weight of this spiritual battle. And Lord, I pray for those who are watching, who are under attack right now, Lord, that you would lift that weight off of them, that they could seek your truth and they could just tell the devil flee. Because we know, Lord, your power is so much greater than his. And Lord, as, as we journey through this life, Lord, allow us to be reminded that you've already won the battle, right? We can lean in and trust that you have won the battle, that you have great plans for us. Allow us to lean into your word. Allow your word to feed us and guide us. In we pray. Amen. Thanks, friends, and God bless. Hey there! Thank you so much for watching and checking us out. Hey, I want you to know we go live every Sunday, 9, 10, 15, and 11, 30. So I would love for you to like and subscribe to make sure that we can stay connected together all the time. I'll see you next time. Bye!